Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Aggieville Alley Cats podcast. We'll come rain, shine, or anything in between. We're here to deliver to you the Kansas State sporting news that you so love. I'm Ace Edwards, right alongside Connor Balthazor and E L I T E 8. That is where the Cats are going to the Elite Eight after, uh, I'm not going to lie to you, a stressful game. A <laughs> little bit of stress. A little bit of stress there. I may or may not had to have uh, busted out the whiskey to survive this game, but lo and never behold, doubt, honestly, yeah, never. Uh, I'm lying to y'all. It was never, <laughs> never in doubt, never stressful. But this was a 98 to 93 overtime Wildcat victory up against the Michigan State Spartans in Madison Square Garden in New York. And you know, first and foremost. This is, I, I believe Drew Galloway said it best when he said, it was the over my dead body game for Marquise Noel. Because if Marquis, if it was possible for Marquise to do it on the floor, he was doing it on the floor. And this is despite rolling his ankle pretty badly and operating off of t- like tape, prayer, and adrenaline. <laughs> but... Yeah. He also, you know, just casually set the NCAA tournament record for assists in a game with 19, had 20 points, and he did half of this on a bum ankle. So I'm not going to call my shot here. I'm not saying that Marquise Noel, almost exclusively for this game, belongs in the rafters. I am saying that he probably should. (laughs) I think... The rafter, I what we can talk about that just like very briefly, I guess, before we get into the game. Mm. Uh, the rafter conversation is super interesting. Uh, I think after getting to the Sweet 16, I think he was in a position where he had a really, really strong argument and was probably going to be there. And I think if there were any doubters left, I think this ended that. Yeah, I, I, I think. He is absolutely going in the rafters. If there's any concern about him being a two-year guy, Mitch Richmond was a a JUCO transfer, Mm -hmm. and he's in the rafters. So there is precedent. Uh, Marquise Noel, All-American. I mean, he's, I think, a single-season assist uh, record. Um, He is pushing for the Big 12 single-season assist record. I think he's 14 away right now. That's doable. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, it's like 14. It, he's close, maybe 15. I, I I can't recall exactly. I know that coming into the game, he was 34 away from Doug Gottlieb's record, and he gets 19 in a game. <laughs> so that puts a pretty, uh, takes out a nice chunk of the lead. Uh, so, wow. And I, I don't think we got to talk about Kentucky as a game. No, we didn't. Uh, on the show yet. Um, it's almost not worth getting into it too much, which is crazy to think about. Yeah. Because at the, at the time it happened, it was like one of the, like, the most fun K-State games that we've had in a long time. A huge emotional win. And like everything was so great. Marquise goes off 27 and nine. We have a, that great stretch to end the game. But it's it's not the best K-State game that's even been played in the last seven days. No. Nope. So, <laughs> That belongs to Michigan State. And do, do we just want to talk about the vibes of this game or do we want to do stats first? Or how do you want to how do you want to attack this here? I don't even know. Uh <laughs> I mean, because we're we're pretty fresh off of this. This is kind of like the first time I think that we've done a game recap the same evening of a game happening. Uh, uh in uh, basketball, yes. For in, basketball, yeah. In football, we did the the uh, the Texas Bowl the same night. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um but yeah, we visit. This is uncharted territory for us, I guess, especially because the emotions are still riding really high. Mm-hmm. Uh, this this was like a a fist pump type of game. Uh, I I think is maybe a good way to put it. I yeah. I'm trying to think of other ways to describe this, like that do it justice. And I'm struggling to find words that really do justice. Just how meaningful this game is. Like obviously, it's important in a literal sense. We won and are going to the Elite Eight, but there's so many storylines converging and so many like great things that have like kind of all been happening all at once. 
everything's coming together. This this game for K State to win, it kind of felt like uh like 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 it was like written in stone almost <laughs> like with the way that it went. Like because there were multiple times in this game I thought we were done for. Yeah. Like especially I think you and I agree on this as well. The three that Michigan State hit in overtime with oh like uh about three minutes to go. Ish. Yeah, I thought that was the dagger. I I I was in dire straits after that happened. Uh, I that that felt insurmountable, uh, and then it was like a one point game, like literally twenty seconds later. But <laughs> yeah, but like when that happened, I audibly groaned and I was like, "Oh my gosh, there's no way." But then, uh, the cats, like they have many times before this year, they find a way. This game was kind of. Kind of similar to the uh, Baylor game, I think, uh, in some ways. Um, yeah. High scoring overtime affair that took some Ish Masood, uh heroics as well as some as a like, all timer from Marquise. Which, which shout out Ish Masood, by the way, for just casually coming up clutch, going four of six from three, and also getting the the go ahead basket with on an inbound play, which. I'm not going to say Ish was the last person that I expected to hit from two on an inbound play, but he was pretty low on the list. I thought if he was inbounding, he'd get it from three. Honestly, I think he would have made it from three. That's how open he was. But no, yeah, he, he, um, that was a mid range shot that he would have taken last year. I think like that was a shot that I think we saw him attempt a lot last season, uh, and uh, very sparingly this year, but wow. I, Ish was so big. He had that logo three as well. Uh, his... Yeah, the the big logo three was especially especially something to note. It was it was taken straight from the Marquise Noel playbook there, and I think that that's really interesting. You cut out there a little bit, but don't worry. Oh, you I, did I, too for me. So oh, well, that's a shame. <laughs> but I, I I kept talking a little bit after a second of pause there. I talked about how. Basically, Ish just stole the logo three from Marquise. Fair enough. I was talking about how uh, I don't know whose audio is going to make it. I think mine because it's recording on mine. Almost certainly will be yours. But I was talking about how uh, um, Ish gained so much confidence, I think, from hitting that deep three at the end of the Kentucky game. And I think that that allows him to have the confidence to take this. Um, It sounds like we're basically going off of vibes right now Mm -hmm. uh, for, for covering this game. Um, I don't, I, man, I, how did you feel at the end of the second half? Uh, cause you know how I felt, uh, which was suboptimal. Oh, I wanted to die. Yeah. I, (laughs) yeah, you, you, you talk a little about it. Yeah. So my, whenever they, they hit the bucket to basically force overtime, uh, no, wait, wait, was it a bucket or free throws? I think it was a bucket. It was a layup, yeah. Yeah, it was a layup. Whenever they hit that, I'm like, oh, no. And I didn't even think it was – I didn't – because, you know, the old adage is if an inferior team takes a superior team to overtime, the superior team is going to win in overtime. Almost like it, – it wasn't even that I think that K-State is an inferior team, obviously. I think that they are the better team. But on the other hand, Tom Izzo <laughs> is the coach of the other team – and also, they were riding a big wave of momentum towards the back end of the second half. And that is what made me more nervous than anything else. That, plus, I, I can talk about this and not be too upset about it because we won. I think Marquise was fouled going up for the layup that would have won the game. I think I many think would agree fouled. with you. I, I think many would agree with you on that point. Uh, many being me, um, and also probably a lot of people online, but... I totally agree. And uh, I also, for me, what I was most worried about was foul trouble. Oh, yeah. Because uh, Gasson and Naquan were both dealing with four fouls. And Naquan had been sitting on four for a while. And Desi, he fouled out pretty fast, honestly. He only played 19 minutes. And uh, he he picked up three in the first half, I think. And... Uh, it was a uh um I, I was mainly worried about foul trouble, but luckily I think Cam Carter was the only person to commit fouls. Uh in the overtime period. I think Keontae might have committed one, maybe. 
Uh, cause cam, I know was super low on fouls. Cause I checked going in the hat, uh, to overtime and he ended up with four. So I think he committed two in overtime, yeah, so but he, he speared a guy and luckily they called it on the floor and not for the three point shot. <laughs> yeah. That was a big turn and it was the right call, but that was a, another really big turning point was, yeah. uh, the, the guy wasn't in his uh, motion yet. Uh, cause that, that would have been really bad, but Wow. I, I'm I'm still writing the emotions of this game. This was, I'm 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 trying to like keep a log of or like make a mental note of like what I think like the best like my favorite K State basketball games ever are, and the only uh, this one is like up there on like Mount Rushmore right now. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm I'm thinking 2010 double overtime Xavier win in the NCAA tournament, uh, 2008 KU at home. Um, this game, then Kentucky man. game last week, <laughs> either the Kentucky game last week or the Kentucky game when we uh went to or when we beat them uh like six years ago, uh, in 2018, um, five or six years ago. It's I, it's one of those two. Um, I, I don't know which it would be. Um, maybe I'll just cheat and say both since it's against the same opponent, yeah. and uh, but this game is going off. I'm my K-State Mount Rushmore right now for the resiliency that they showed for the all-time, like, probably one of the best single-game performances we've ever seen from a K-State player, Marquise Noel, pretty much single-handedly willing this team to victory. Yet the another... Over my yeah, dead body game. Yet, yet another unbelievable clutch performance late in the game this team is one of the most clutch k-state teams i've ever seen and it feels so good to say that because i've had to deal with so much anti-clutch in my experience as a k-state fan i have so many teams and we've had so many squads just not be able to finish and that's when you tell you how that's how that's how you can tell you have a good team with really good coaching is uh, a team that knows how to close out games and the lob to Keontae. Uh, at the end and just the confidence that they had to like do that and do it like so effectively like a reverse slam alley-oop at the end of the game you have to be very confident uh, in, in yourself and your teammates to pull something off like that and they did and that's something that they, they've, they've done similar stuff throughout the year we've seen multiple games be sealed by uh keys to kj lobs uh ku game and overtime as well um, the Oklahoma State game that was not as close, but the ceiling play was a uh, lob from Keys to Keontae, and um, I think that's all I can think of for now. Mm. But we, this team is just so so clutch. Um, they do it so in the lob, fun way. They do it yeah. the fun way. Yeah, they're they're so entertaining. They they shot uh, out uh, in an outstanding way. And another huge thing, huge thing that I think has been getting un it's been a little bit unnoticed, but similar to the Kentucky game, only five turnovers in this game. That that was a big factor we knew going in. Michigan State does not force a lot of turnovers as a defense. We knew that. Keontae Johnson had two. Marquise Noel had two. Bebe had one in the like 90 seconds he was on the floor. Yeah. And that's Which, it. That's a shame, Bebe. That could have happened to anybody. It could have. I don't hold it against him. It just happened. Uh, 26 assists, granted 19 from Noel. 26 assists as a team to five turnovers. That's pretty phenomenal for a team assist turnover ratio, especially a team that struggles to hold on to the ball as much as we do. Um. Wow. And then shoot 56% from the field, 46% from three. Struggle at the free throw line a little bit, uh, 11 to 16, but perfect in overtime. Man, I'm I'm rambling a little bit, I guess, just because this is still so fresh, but yeah. so many big shots. Yeah. Cam I mean, Carter was huge in this game. Yeah, Cam quietly was was pretty good as well, you know, two of three from three. It was just just going through the, the step weight, you take starters because you take starters for the men. All right. Keontae Johnson, uh, he goes all 45, uh, 22 points in this one, 10 of 18 from the field, one of four from three, one of two, the free throw line, uh, missed the front end of a one and one, uh, then has six rebounds, two fouls, one assist, two turnovers. He finished with 22 points, including that clutch lob 
that we were talking about, uh, he was fantastic. He This was the Keontae Johnson that we needed, that we didn't see as much of in the Kentucky game. This was exactly what we needed from Keontae Johnson. And he was electric in this game. Had a big and one where he uh, kind of did that like and one like celebration thing that he does, like the kind of the signal that the refs do. He did that in the KU game as well that I can remember. Uh, but he was not the man of the hour. Uh, man of the hour, man of the <laughs> century. Marquis man of the millennia, man. <laughs> he... It was 43 minutes, only was on the bench because he uh, probably sprained his ankle uh, yeah. from what it looks like. I rolled it. I'm so sorry, man. Your ankle's going to really hurt tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, having sprained, having also sprained my ankle, uh, that same ankle in a basketball game. So basically, I'm Marquise Noel. <laughs> yeah. You're a bit taller than Marquise, man. <laughs> I, I am a bit taller and also not as good at basketball. Uh, <laughs> uh, but he misses two minutes. Only two minutes. It felt like way longer. Yeah. He played 43. Uh, it was 7 of 18 from the field, 2 of 6 from 3, 4 of 4 at the free throw line, um, 3 rebounds, 2 fouls, and then NCAA single game record setting 19 assists <laughs> to just 2 turnovers. 19 assists in one game. I think that's the K-State single game record. It's the NCAA single game record. Beat that by 1. Uh, he's now... R- in dangerous, dangerously close to breaking the Big 12 single season assist record. Uh, he's probably going to go down as the all-time greatest distributor at K-State because if he was a four-year guy, he would absolutely shatter every the record. assist record. <laughs> every assist, uh, I, I guess the assist record, uh, right. would be absolutely demolished by Marquise Noel. And it's not just that he gets the 19 assist. And it's not even just that he only had two turnovers in this game. It's that he did a lot of it on an injured ankle. I mean, you, and then he also had five steals and 20 points. So there's that. But I want to get back to just Marquise Noel as a whole. And we can have a broader discussion about him because he warranted it. Mm-hmm. Uh, he When, when there's a, a, a performance this good, you have to stop and talk about it. Yeah. And he... uh he, he was phenomenal. I will say, you may choose to believe me or not. Um, I, I was chatting today with a, uh, meaning Thursday, day of the game, um, with a uh, friend of mine I sit next to in uh, my classes at Washburn. Um, and he knows nothing about sports. He knows I'm a big K-State fan, but he's clueless on sports, like doesn't follow them at all, uh, uh, but like knows like a few big things. And we were talking about the game with... I was talking about the game with him and then a KU fan who sits in front of me uh, who did bet on the Cats to win or he bet he bet the spread on him and also the Noel assist over. So he he hit on both of those. Congratulations, <laughs> Andrew. But uh, uh, this guy, I, we're, we're talking and I say, I, I'm like trying to be general about it. And I'm like, you know, our point guard needs to have a huge game, I think, uh, for us to win because if he isn't playing well, then the whole team doesn't really play well. Uh, like Like he just needs to have like uh, I, I I said this is probably a legacy game for him. Like like he can really improve his legacy. Like he needs to like really have a big night. And so he's like, oh, like the Jordan flu game. I'm like, well, probably not like that. But <laughs> he, but but he needs to have a really great night. And he goes out and hurts his ankle, and still manages to have an all time performance <laughs> on it. So technically not a flu game, but a, a game. but but a seriously hampered by. Uh, a factor that is limiting his athleticism and still managing to have fantastic all time legacy performance uh, on the biggest stage possible in, in his, his hometown, hometown <laughs> in the biggest arena, one of the most legendary arenas in the world, Madison square garden in front of friends and family. Um, I mean, that that's the sort of that that is a Hollywood script for mm-hmm. Marquise Noel to have the best game that he has ever played in his first game in Madison Square Garden in his hometown. Like you cannot write it better than that, I think. Oh, no, like, you can't. You just can't. Like, like I, I don't know what you would add. I mean, he faced the adversity with getting injured. He fights through it, makes that crazy three at the end of the shot clock. Ends the game with the clutch lob 
to the incredible like teammate like who also is basically guy. having his own his own story it's a crossover episode yeah like how how do you make it it's like a uh, they were destined to win this game. I said it today before. It was like it was etched in stone before that they were going to win the way that we were just making every big play that we needed to. So shout out to my buddy Noah. Uh, he had no idea what he was saying, but he did kind of like accidentally <laughs> he call. call. He called his <laughs> he, shot. He did call a shot. And I will be telling him that tomorrow that he actually did. Uh, uh, <laughs> they kind of figured that out. So big shout out to him. Uh, I will be asking him to make more predictions in the future. <laughs> All of them in favor of the cats, naturally. Uh, of course. Um, I will ask him to not injure the players, though, uh, in the future. Um, just play well without it, like without the <laughs> like, turned ankle. But I don't know. It speaks volumes to Marquise Noel's toughness uh, and his resiliency and also everybody's faith in him and also to his importance. Uh, to this roster because we saw the wheels just really fell off when he was not on the court. Yeah. And we've seen that all year, but it, everything got bad when he was not on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. I, he, he was unbelievable. I, I, I did see people, um, people that aren't K state fans uh, that have just like been watching March madness and starting to like follow K state. Um, they did say he needs to stop chucking logo threes. And I'm like, he probably one of them was a little bit poor timing. I'd say kind of late in overtime, like probably didn't need to take that. Um, but I do think people just aren't used to like him doing that because it yeah. is really unusual. And, but once you start seeing him go in, you're like, okay. Yeah. Sure, like, I like, understand. Yeah. But Casey's kind of become like America's team as of late. Like, it, it, it or, or at least is contending for it. Like it feels like we've been working our way into kind of a um larger position and like share of the uh um like basketball sphere. Um, I was going through a few days ago, um, on TikTok and I was bookmarking um um videos that people had made using uh the uh sound um. Um, that the team has dancing to the uh, little baby track that mm -hmm. went viral. Uh, there, there's been a, actually a lot of imitators that are doing the same thing and getting a lot of views. Um, and also other K State related stuff like CBS Sports put up a Keontae Johnson video that has 3 million views on TikTok, 480,000 likes. Um, let's see what else. Um, Dude Perfect, of course, they put out a video. Oh yeah, the, uh, the imitation yeah. there. That one's at four hundred sixty thousand views. There's a, a video of K State a home game, uh, doing their their a dance before a game. Six hundred twenty thousand views. Um, some high schoolers imitating K State doing the uh, dance. They got six hundred fifty thousand. Uh, like they did their own thing. Uh, they were imitating it. Some other people did it. One hundred eighty thousand. Uh, someone made a video of putting that music over Tang Wah bashing in the student section, 900,000 views. Uh, the actual video in the locker room, 1.1 million. You may be asking, why am I sharing all of this? Uh, the sure. answer the answer is that we are starting to become a trendy team. And I think this is proof of the ability that Tang and his coaching staff and the team have to connect uh, with an audience that I don't think that we're used to K-State connecting with. Mm -hmm. And all in all, I think it's a great thing. I It, it shows their ability to tap in to uh, what, what, what younger people want uh, and things that um, other people will find interesting. And it shows that there's um, that K-State uh, does have a spot in the larger, broader landscape of college athletics. Mm -hmm. So I know that there it is semi anecdotal evidence and isn't like a guarantee of like future social media success and at the end of the day it's just tiktok like who cares but yeah. <laughs> i i i did think it was cool to see other people like trying to make a trend and actually kind of succeeding out of this thing that k-state did just as a team mm -hmm. uh starting i think with their first home game uh, all the way back in November, but it just wasn't publicized for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And then they 
they were cool enough to have it be a trend instead of something that like people made fun of or they thought like was stupid. So yeah. I thought that I thought that was cool. A, a bit a bit of a, a side tangent, um, but I'm. I, I just want to say all good things about K-State right now. Uh, so Mushroom Tang has earned that at this point. I mean, I don't have a negative thing to say about this team. No, not today. Not, not today. today. You could you could you could say things, but I'm just going to not. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. Yeah, we it, we can kind of just in the interest of time, just the, the big players of you know, Cam Carter getting 12, Naquan getting 11, seven boards. Uh, Desi, unfortunately, fouling out, but he was starting. Ish Masood going four of six from three, 15 total points. David Gasson going perfect from the field and hitting a 100% on purpose, I promise, three-point shot. Yeah. Is- <laughs> and breaking both of his free throws. And breaking both of the free throws. A tradition unlike any other. Uh, David Gasson breaking his free throws yet. Uh, going perfect from the field. Yeah. But that is the this game. We could talk about it for probably another hour if we wanted yeah. to. But we we have other things to talk about on this, this yeah. episode. The last thing I'll say about it is after a few sleeps, I'm going to be interested to see what a rational Connor thinks about this game's place and not only K-State lexicon, but also the history of really great NCAA tournament games. Mm-hmm. I think right now this game probably is the front runner for game of the year uh, in the NCAA tournament. Yeah, And we had another candidate the game before it. Can we just yeah. have one normal game? This team is going to have so much real estate in the one shining moment uh, highlight montage that they yeah. do at the end of the tournament. Like there's gonna be a full minute dedicated to Marquise Noel and gang and the the re- and company and the their dunks and various antics that they uh go about the t- the but, hullabaloo that they get up to yeah all their their shenanigans but wow what what an incredible game this will go down as a all timer incredible memories uh complete straight shot of dopamine. Uh, after the win what a relief it was also shout out tom Izzo saying that we got lucky uh two coaches in a row that we have broken <laughs> yeah but that this game is not where it ends we're still dancing and our next opponent we actually waited to start recording uh I, yeah it was kind of on accident not gonna lie we that we waited to stop for this but our next opponent will be the florida atlantic university owls abbreviated FAU don't get confused we're not going up against Felix reincarnated as a basketball team uh, that, that would be scary. horrifying that 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 would be the most physical basketball game of all Can time you imagine just like five Felixes coming out of the tunnel doing the sack celebration <laughs> they would all foul out in like 10 minutes too <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so we, we can talk a little bit about the the challenges that FAU brings normally like I think you said this last week because I listened to to last week's episode. Um, FAU, we don't normally give like pregame, uh, pregame stuff because I don't feel I'm not smart enough for it. I leave that to KSO. <laughs> but uh, uh, KSU underscore fan does some great stuff. Flando for KSO especially does great mm-hmm. work. But yeah, FAU presents some unique challenges. In that they're around, if I'm remembering correctly, they're around where we are in Ken Palm. They're- I'm checking right now because I, I had not checked before. They're actually ahead of us in really? Ken Palm. We are 21st and they are 17th. And that mm. is updated for the results of tonight's game. Mm. Yeah, they- um, they, I, I'm looking around at FAU's numbers. I'll just go through them kind of quickly here. Uh, Florida Atlantic, um, adjusted offensive efficiency. They're 26th in the country. Um, adjusted defensive efficiency, they're 29th in the country for reference. K-State 35th in adjusted offensive efficiency and 27th in adjusted defensive efficiency. So they're about 10 spots better offensively than we are, and we're about even uh, defensively. Um, um, then adjusted tempo, they are a much slower-paced team than we are. We're 43rd in tempo. They are 158 
Ken Palm has a uh, luck rating. I mentioned it last week. I yeah, still you don't didn't know, know what that was. was. I don't know what it is either. Yeah, Florida Atlantic is um, a luckier team than we are, according to Ken Palm, whatever that sure. means. Um, obviously, we have a much stronger strength of schedule. Florida Atlantic's in Conference USA. There's just nothing that they can really do about that. Mm-hmm. Um, they're very good. Um, uh, they're a well-rounded team, I guess, is probably the best way to put it. But... Um, yeah, this is, I, I was not going to be comfortable facing Florida Atlantic or Tennessee. Tennessee is the seventh ranked team in Kempom. Uh, so, uh, Florida Atlantic just took out a really high quality team. Tennessee mm-hmm. was the number one adjusted defensive efficiency team in Kempom. So I, I was not, uh, not super happy about this. Also Tennessee, uh, Really bad luck rating, 318th in the country. <laughs> Could have happened to anybody. Unlucky. Could have happened yeah. to anybody. <laughs> Unlucky, truly. But yeah, Florida Atlantic, this is a good team. Do not overlook them just because they're Conference USA and had uh, not the strongest schedule. This is and a also quality. K State's history with mid majors. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I'm like horrified to speak that into existence, but it is true. Um, our. Um, history facing mid majors in the elite eight uh, in the last fifteen years, not great. Uh, Loyola Chicago back in twenty eighteen broke my heart. Uh, same with Butler back in twenty ten, and that was coming off of an overtime Sweet Sixteen game uh, in, in a really hard fought battle that um, had scores that got up into the nineties. Um, so hopefully we can rewrite that um, history um, because this team. I, I, for lack of a better phrase, they're built different. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, they, they're constructed alternatively. I, I'm led to, I'm inclined to believe that Marquise Noel will simply not allow that to happen. Uh, yeah, not in Madison Square Garden, he won't. I, I just don't think he would allow it. Um, I, I, I am definitely still nervous though, um, about this Florida Atlantic game. Um, they're, they're a really quality team. They just took down a really quality team in Tennessee as well. Uh, I don't have as much um, statistically as I did with Montana State, other than uh, Florida Atlantic, uh, thirty-four and three. Um, so they're a really good squad. Um, also, timing uh, the schedule just got released uh, for Saturday. Um, K State. We'll be taking on Florida Atlantic on TBS at 6.09. Interesting time choice. Not sure why we don't wait till 10 or do it at 8. But Okay. I am, Who am I to contest? Maybe the I, 9 is supposed to be a reference to Marquise Noel's 19 yeah. assists. And that is Eastern time. Uh, 5.09 Central. Central. Okay. Uh, for what it's worth. Uh, but Florida Atlantic, um, raw numbers, uh, um, this is using Yahoo Sports, so take it with a grain of salt. Uh, 15th in the country in total rebounds. Um, not a fantastic free throw shooting team. Uh, middle of the pack there, but a very good shooting team. Otherwise, score a lot of points, uh, both total points and points per game. Don't block a lot of shots. Uh, assist to turnover ratio as a team is really good. Uh, they're really solid up and down. Uh, have some really good pieces. Um, have uh. I'm a big center as well, seven one two forty. Um, they're all all around a very well rounded squad, uh, and they all shoot the ball pretty decently. Uh, John L. Davis shoots fifty percent from the field, almost thirty nine percent from three. This is a good squad, um, and we cannot overlook them. I have no doubt in my mind that we won't overlook them um, as a basketball team. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't want the fans to overlook them. Uh, I know that doesn't actually matter like for like the game, but no. for your own sanity, don't. So yeah, it, 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 here's the clip notes. Don't. Yeah. But this is a good FAU squad. Um, with that being said, I would rather face them in Tennessee solely and solely because Tennessee's incredible defense really frightened me. And that's not be and that's not a dig at FAU. That is because FA. Uh, that's because I think Tennessee would have been a really, really tough matchup. Where I think we at least match up well with FAU on a, um, without having done a ton of research into them. So that could be off base. But based off what we do know, 
I, I, I intrigued by our matchup with FAU. I think we stand a better shot. Tennessee defensively would have been suffocating and would have been really difficult to work with. But I, I won't ramble any longer about FAU just because I just don't know enough about them right now because we, we didn't even know we'd be playing them until like less than an hour ago. So, yeah. but it's a, it's a great time to be a K State basketball fan. It's a great day to be a Wildcat. Yeah. Oh, uh, another thing I want to mention uh, score tied in this game 14 times, lead changed 16 times. God. Uh, it was a <laughs> there. There's a reason this game was as heart wrenching um, as it uh, as it felt. Like I I was never really comfortable. If you go look at the win probability on ESPN, it it's went a back and coaster. forth. It's literally yeah. just a roller. Coaster. It, it was a roller coaster. Um, it it was very back and forth. Um, utterly horrifying. UCLA uh, just fell. UCLA just lost. Mm-hmm. Oh. Who were they playing? Uh, Zags. Interesting. So it's a uh, Gonzaga UConn, the other side of the lead eight bracket. Gonzaga UConn, and then, uh, so we'll get the winner of that game. Well, will we? No, no, no. We won't. We're on the other understand. side of the bracket. Yeah, we get the winner of Bama. Uh, we get either Bama, San Diego State, or Creighton or Princeton. So probably mm-hmm. Bama. Assuming we win. Uh, anyway, I it, we can cross that bridge when we get there. FAU is the focus right now. But that's men's basketball. But we also have a little bit of women's basketball to talk about in their quest in the NIT. And they advanced to the Sweet 16 of the NIT by beating Wyoming 71 to 55. They end up playing, they will end up playing Washington in the Sweet 16 for the NIT. But this was just like it. If I were to put solid women's basketball game for k-state and just like try to quantify it i'd probably point to this game because that's how i that's how i describe it you know serena sundell goes five of six one of one from three nine of ten on her free throws uh five assists unfortunately five turnovers so maybe that's a little less than ideal she had 20 points gabby gregory had 19 briley glenn had 10 sarah shamatsi nine jalen glenn three eliza Moppin embarrassing people by being more athletic than them which you think it would get old it's not getting old (laughs) and then rebecca dollinger you know making a three so that's yeah good good for her (laughs) Uh, uh, finally doing uh some of the stuff she was brought in for she's been struggling from three for a while but yeah this was a solid solid win uh, it's been a little while since this game happened, it feels like, even though it actually hasn't been. It's been like two days, but there's been a whole other basketball <laughs> game since then. That, that, that game aged me, bro. <laughs> yeah, the, the Michigan State game just destroyed me. It took years off my life. But yeah, this was a solid basketball win. Um, some contributors do decently here. Uh, Moppin got six points, four boards, uh, no fouls in 13 minutes. Uh, so continuing to develop there, uh, swatted somebody into a different dimension than had she does one that a lot turnover. Too. She does do it. <laughs> so I don't think people realize how high she can jump and they realize when it's far too late. I but, really want to see her dunk. I I know she can do it. Yeah. We we have verbal confirmation of it, allegedly, from which I say allegedly. I heard him say it. Brian Smoller said on the broadcast once that Eliza Moppin can dunk. She can do it. So I would love for a breakaway uh um, fast break for Eliza to happen. I'd also like to see her um, add some range uh, to her game. I think if she could occasionally step out and take a three, not become like a sharpshooter or anything, but step out and take a three, which I think there's highlights of her doing at the high school level. That would be pretty fantastic, I think, for developing her game further. But And then Emily Ebert did not score, but had seven rebounds and three assists and a block. So solid contributions there from Ebert. Um, but yeah, uh, Sundell and Gregory uh, carried the banner. Shocker um, that who, is. But... Who could have guessed that would happen? Yeah. And then a um, familiar face on the other team, uh, Malene Peterson. Uh, she started her career at K-State, but had a uh, season-ending injury uh, before her freshman year. So she redshirted and then transferred to Wyoming. And she was the Mountain West Freshman of the Year this season and had 15 points 
So uh, doing pretty solid is Malian Peterson uh, over at Wyoming. Yeah. Uh, another, th- like like I said, this was just an, an overall solid game. I, I, you'd want the free throw, pr- not the free throw, the field goal percentage to be a little higher than 37.7%. But we hit on 35% of our threes, which I, I don't want to be mean, but it's kind of a miracle that we did that. <laughs> yeah, we've been shooting pretty well in the NIT uh, so far, knock on wood. Uh, but we'll see if that continues. Um, which uh, we have not really been able to string together many consistent stretches of hot shooting. Uh, we'll see if that changes, though. Yep. So as we mentioned before, the next game for the WNIT is against Washington. To The day this comes out, Friday, at 9 p.m. Central Time. Uh, apparently, the only way to watch it is, quote, Washington live stream. I don't think that's real. <laughs> I don't think that I don't think that's a real thing. I think they're lying to me. But yeah, so obviously support women's basketball. There's no other way. Yeah, there's a well, there's one other event. We'll talk about that in a minute. But they're the women's basketball team. They deserve the support, even if they're in the the WNIT. So cheer them on. They honestly. It, They've gotten hot enough recently that they probably could make a decent run in this WNIT, which is kind of what we predicted happening. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I think if you get over this hump, because uh, the biggest issue with this game is that it's a road game. Yeah. Uh, and I th- I think we're still yet to win on the road this year. Uh, so if we can buck that trend, then uh, you'd be correct. By the way, we have not won on the road this year. Shocker. But if we can buck that trend. And then hopefully we can come back to the friendly confines of Bramlage uh, and take on another squad. But yeah, uh, playing for postseason hardware, whether it's the instant layer and IT um, still support the cats. Uh, and uh, yeah, they blew out an in-state rival handled Wyoming. Uh, yeah. And then Washington's going to be a solid matchup. Um, looking forward to it. Uh, some late night Friday entertainment. If you don't have other plans. Uh, which I'm sure most of the people listening to this do not. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's women's basketball. But of course, we're a men's golf school, so we have to talk about men's golf. That we are. The uh, the seventeenth ranked men's golf squad got fourth at a two over par in the All American Classic, and Tim Tillman's had three under par and was in the top ten. And uh, I believe that they're the other three of the four members of the team all tied for 21st. At It was either mm-hmm. two or three over. It was around there. Um, what was the uh, um, break even uh, on, on strokes? Uh, on strokes, on I, think part... was, I think it was 87. Hold on. Par 72. Okay. I lied. Times three. 216. They were all three over. Mm-hmm. Uh, Will Hopkins, Nicholas Mason, and Cooper Schultz. They all tied for 21st at three over. And Luke O'Neill goes uh, five over uh, at uh, 221 strokes. Uh, so solid uh, performance. Um, kind of um, kind lost of on it a... towards the end. <laughs> yeah. We, we made a run um, to get to the top, but kind of didn't have a great last round. Uh, definitely could have, um, cut it down, uh, but just weren't quite able to get over the hump and really have a, um, an, an excellent, um, tournament outing, but still had a good outing finish at the top of the pack. Um, granted separated from the top three schools, which, uh, two teams tied for second at minus five. Um, but we still finished fourth, um, Right up there with some other ranked squads, uh, we're, and we're showing that we belong uh, at the very least. Um, and yeah, uh, Club Cats um, have another nice outing. Nice that we actually have a reason to talk about them. Uh, I guess there's something else uh, to um, chat about. And again, it's not like there's live streams of these, so really all you can do is just kind of like follow the scores, mm-hmm. like on the stat track, and just say, "Oh, hey, we're doing all right," or "Oh, we're not doing as well." Uh, that's really about all you can do. Other than I think they live stream like the Big 12 meet. That's about it, I think. But 
I remember hearing that they were going to start doing that, but who's to say? Yeah. So that is men's golf, and then I get to talk about it. All right. We we can kind of zoom through this at this point, I think, because I, I I don't think many people want to talk about the uh the back cats. Yeah. <laughs> So the the first first series we'll talk about was Baylor and Connor and I said beforehand that we should we should not have lost this Baylor series because Baylor is just they're not good. I I, I don't want to mix words here. They're straight up just not good. Yeah. However, uh, we we won the first game pretty convincingly eight to one. So that that gave that gave us a little bit of hope. Then the next two games happened. We lost both of them four to eight, including one of the most hilarious choke jobs that I have ever seen with an eight run six inning in which Pete Hughes completely basically told Ty Rule to die for the second time this year. First time being up against LSU. And if you want my thoughts on that, go back and listen to whatever episode we covered the LSU game in, because this is the second time that Pete Hughes has told his best reliever when he's clearly not having his best day that he can kick rocks and die. Yeah. And uh, what's also crazy about, uh, about that inning is that uh, only one of the six runs that Ty rule gave up on the sixth inning uh, or the eight runs, I should say on um, that he gave up in that inning. Um, only one was earned. He only gave up one earned run. Uh, cause, uh, two of the base runners were inherited. Um, but then he hits on his very first pitch and hits a guy with the pitch one strike and then hits another guy at the pitch walks in a run and then reach on a fielder's choice, uh, with a fielding error at third, uh, score on the error and then a sing infield single, everybody advances. A guy scores and ties it unearned. Uh, sack fly, uh, hit another single, and then he's gone. Uh, and all of a sudden, blink and you'll miss it. We went from up four zero to down uh, six to four. And then he gets credited for uh, a couple more runs uh, after that. I think. Mm-hmm. I, I, I. Yeah. So the Baylor series was frustrating. Is there anyone who really you know stood out offensively? I mean, Pelletier did well because he's quietly been, you know, one of the the more better offensive pieces as a catcher, which I would admit is very impressive. You know, collecting a hit and at least one hit in every single game, including three in the first game. Uh, in terms of RBI, who led the series, it looks like Kojo. Yeah, Kojo led with five, but you know it. It's just so, it's so damn frustrating. Like this, because this team should be better than they are. And they should be able to win away series, especially up against Baylor, who's there. They're in the middle of a transitory period and weren't good before the transitory period and still aren't. It's so frustrating, man. I, yeah. I, my standard on the episode I did solo was we need to get out of the Baylor series at least with a 2 1 victory. And we had every opportunity to do that. And we did not. Um, pitching was inconsistent. Fielding was inconsistent. Bats did not show up when they needed to. At one point or another, every facet of the game struggled at, uh, at some point. We, Every everything was not good at some point. Wentworth had another rough start. Uh, Shea Hardis wasn't very good either. Um, just all around struggles everywhere. Um, not a lot of guys performed up to their uh, uh, their best ability um, through, for the entire series consistently. Cash usually had a, a nice final day, but it hardly mattered. But man. Just a really, really, really bad look to start Big 12 play, uh, dropping a series that was very winnable, uh, especially to taking the first game. Uh, 
even though it's on the road at this point, I'm done making excuses about road losses. No. I, we were generous last year at some points, I think. Uh, at some point, you have to figure out a way to win on the road because uh, the, the goal is to make it to the postseason yeah, and there needs not, to be a postseason standard. It's it's not even winning. It's not. It's just not getting embarrassed. I think that's the worst part is that every single time we lose, it's in some embarrassing way. It's in like we choke the game away because Pete Hughes leaves a reliever in too long or he brings in the wrong reliever or the bats go completely cold for no good reason. We are incapable of playing a complete game on the road. And I think that's the worst part. Like if, if we got a few, like obviously road losses are going to happen in the big 12, it's a good baseball conference. Like you're going to have a couple tough luck losses where you put everything together and you still lose. That sucks, but it happens. Unfortunately, it, it just hasn't happened in these past few years to K-State. They've had very few just straight up tough luck losses because they just have one thing in particular fall apart. And it's every a road game. Yeah. And uh, we've seen a lot of base running errors as well. Um, Granted, I will say some of those are honest, honestly not on Pete in the moment. Yeah. Some of the, it, it is ultimately on Pete in a larger sense, in a coaching sense. Uh, but uh, there, there are multiple times that you can see in the games happen over the last week that guys just didn't look to third when rounding second and then rounded second and got, got caught in no man's land. And that's on them to a certain extent especially when Pete is holding up the sign to stop and they just don't. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a, um, it's a tough look, but even if it is them, like, like, yeah, you look at it and it's, it is on them, but it is on Pete to an extent. Um, he's a, he's a coach that they're, they're supposed to be disciplined and known to do that. Uh, when they're rounding second to look to third, to get a note on it. Cause you're not always going to have the best judgment on if you think you can make it to third or not. So it's a uh, super frustrating struggling with a lot of the same things that we always have. Yep. And then, uh, well, we'll talk about the one positive first, the first game of St. Thomas first game was good. Nick Goodwin had five RBI. Brendan Jones had two. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's about it. Now we have to talk about it. Now I, I, I understand sometimes you, you lose to to fellow Big Twelve schools when you shouldn't. I even understand losing to group of five schools. You know, with a with a, a mediocre record. What I don't understand is losing to a one and thirteen St. Thomas squad. That is not good. And not only losing, you get shut out until basically garbage time in the ninth inning, and then you're unable to execute any time that you get runners on. This includes after taking, what was it, nine walks, leaving a total of seven runners on base. Twelve. We left 12, twelve on. Yeah, leaving 12 runners on base. My bad. I was looking at the wrong stat line. And it was okay. It gets worse. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Don't misunderstand. It gets worse. Uh, nine walks. 12 left on base, six strikeouts, four hits, one run. I, this game honestly came very close to breaking me. I, I, there, there's a difference between not having an excuse and then just not having an excuse. Like, St. Thomas is a bad school. And I don't mean academically. I mean they're bad at baseball. Because they've been a D1 program for like two years. There is no universe in which a head coach who has been at K-State, what is it, six years now? Five, six, somewhere around there. So There's no universe in which not only do we drop this game, but we only score a single run and leave 12 runners on base. 
That shouldn't happen, especially not at home. When our entire thing, the entire year, has been, oh, we're really good as a home team. We're exceptional hitting as a home team because we have the ability to drive balls out in Twin. We couldn't make solid contact the entire game against a pitching staff that is just bad. Yeah. I think it's all the fifth inning to get a hit in this game. We were getting no hit through five. That shouldn't happen. If you look up and down this roster, the likelihood of players like and I'm not even counting like the 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 players that are are just average because honestly at this point I'm I don't want to pin it on the players because I know the players individually the pieces are good they hit every note that they should but they can't make it sound good together it's like having an instrument that's out of tune in an orchestra everyone's gonna know it can hit every note that it's supposed to on paper, but if it's out of tune, who cares? So you can have the individual pieces of Brendan Jones, you know, Nick Goodwin, Kojo, Cash Rugely, and then uh, Jaden Lobliner and Roberto Pena. You can have all of those, like, but the likelihood of all of them having a bad day and having a bad day at the same time, I, it's just frustrating because this team should be so much better than it is this isn't a case of you know oh like oh our recruiting classes just haven't been that great you know maybe we'll get the players in someday no no <laughs> like the the players that we are bringing in on a year-to-year basis should make us at minimum a mid-tier big 12 school at absolute minimum and we're just not developing them and i hate to turn this into a a full season rant because at this point it seems like every other episode where we talk about the back hats it's a full season rant but i'll stop doing it whenever i don't have a reason to the rants will cease when morale improves (laughs) yeah i that that's my little spiel do you do you have anything that stuck out to you about this game or even this season up to this point? One of the only truly good things to take away is that Jackson Wentworth came in relief, pitched three innings to work on his command, and actually did pretty well. Mm -hmm. Uh, He kind of struggled through his first several starts uh, as a weekend starter, and he's not yet been announced as a starter this weekend. So... uh, Probably not going to be starting. Might be taking the weekend off to get some uh, extra practice in, uh, yeah. just because he has been struggling with uh, command and location. And, and if um, he's out, I would put Mason Bus in because he's been one of the he's been one of the few bright spots of the team. Yeah. Mason Bus, as a true freshman, has been pitching far beyond his years. He's been very impressive, and um, and that is that th- that is something to write home about. Mason Bus, really good. Um, but. This team's just so inconsistent. And I get that Kalen Culpepper's hurt, but that loss should not hurt the team this much. That is an indictment of our depth and ability to adapt. And Kalen Culpepper's fantastic. Don't don't get me wrong there. He's a big loss. Like I'm sympathetic there and understand that losing Kalen is a really big shot to this team. But that does not mean that we should be struggling to the point that we lose to a near winless team from Minnesota, a not exactly notorious. Uh, the northern parts of the U.S. are not exactly known for being like the mecca of baseball. baseball. But yeah, really, 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 really bad week for the back cats that luckily we don't have to think about as much because uh men's cats cabal has been killing it yeah. so uh we can just kind of pretend it doesn't exist to a certain degree yeah and uh tomorrow the back cats do have a series tomorrow up against oklahoma it is a home series they play uh friday at six saturday at four yeah good luck competing with cats cabal and then yeah. sunday <laughs> at one we may not even tweet that game <laughs> yeah 
I I think the first time we tweeted during about baseball during a basketball game, it was like charming. The second time, I think people were like, whatever. So yeah. I I I think maybe we'll just like tweet like an update at the end of, the, of that game. Uh, but I don't think we're gonna live tweet during it. Yeah. Uh, just because I. I kind of just to. don't want to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, like I'm gonna be watching the basketball game. So, um, unless we get like destroyed or something, but that won't happen. No, it's not gonna happen. But that that does it for the the news segments, and now we can move on to the wacky segment of the week. Try to bring the the energy up a little bit. And this week's wacky segment question is: If you could move every K State basketball game to New York, would you? Um. That's an interesting question. I would, but only if we could keep prime Marquise Noel forever. <laughs> I would okay. abs- I would absolutely do it if that was also in it. Okay. Um, that 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 is what that 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 is my standard, I guess. What about you? No, I I would as well. For as long as Marquise Noel is here, I absolutely would move every single game to Madison Square Garden. Just because I, I'm not sure there's a soul on earth that could beat Marquise Noel in in Madison Square Garden. I I just don't think he'll let it happen. I just don't I don't think he'll let it happen. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I I I think you're right. I think he will simply intervene. Um I <laughs> I I I don't think that he would allow such a uh, disrespect to come uh to him. Yeah. But speaking of moving basketball to uh, New York, uh, I don't know if you saw, but this is uh, actually fairly related. Um, but today the Big 12 announced a uh, um, series that they're going to be doing with uh, Rucker Park. Mm-hmm. You did see that? Yeah, I saw it. Hosting yeah. a bunch of like uh, coaching camps and exhibitions there. Yeah, I think that's super cool. I do as uh, well. That's actually sick. Yeah, they're, uh, uh, it's going to be... a. Uh, um, I'm reading the press release right now from the Big 12. Um, they announced it in um before the K State game. Um, they uh are partnering with Rucker Park. Um, uh, and uh, which if you've watched a K State game, you've heard of Rucker Park at this point, like the famous street ball, uh, spot in New York, uh, that Marquise Noel um played out a lot. I'm um, going to see Big 12 operate youth clinics for uh grade six and below over multiple de- multiple days led by men's and women's head coaches um and they're going to host um men's and women's summer exhibition games summer exhibition games at record park pending into double approval uh and the b12 was also planning a variety of entertainment enhancements and community engagements uh throughout the conferences record park uh activations uh mm-hmm. so uh, they got some quotes from your mark, some quotes from the mayor of NYC who had made fun of Kansas a lot. So hopefully we're shutting him up now. Uh, but um, how about that? Um, pretty, pretty cool stuff. Uh, it's announced, especially with uh, all the New York uh, Wildcats um, back home. Uh, I like the idea of uh, summer exhibitions. Yeah. Um, um, I, I do worry a little bit about injuries, I guess, but I imagine that they probably would not be like, I don't think they're going hard, bro. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think so either. Um, I always fear an accidental injury, but that'd be something nice kind of break up the monotony of the summer when it comes to college sports. Cause say for the college world series, basically nothing happens all summer for college sports. So I, I like it. Um, uh, and it, it it is related to the wacky segment. Uh, so I'm um, hopefully Marquise Noel can uh, be involved in that somehow. Yeah. Uh, and shout out to Brett Yormark, uh, Big Twelve Commissioner, who has been putting in so much legwork to up the conference's um public perception, um, and also all the rumors going around about us um adding a basketball school, so adding St. John's, and we're trying to get into the New York market here with Rucker Park. To me, this is really indicating that we're probably adding St. John's uh, mm-hmm. at this point since they're in New York school. Um, TBD on how I feel about adding basketball schools that like don't compete in football. Mm-hmm. I, I think I'm pretty, you can't see it, but A shrugged his shoulders. As mm-hmm. of now, I'm like that. I'm curious how much money it adds. Uh, 
if, if it adds a lot of money to media, uh, when your mark decides to negotiate basketball rights separately, then hey, I'm all for it. Um, if it at least helps with perception and increases the value of the conference in some way, sure. That'd be kind of weird to play schools that we don't play in football, yeah. I guess, and add a lot of teams to the conference. But I'm at the very least open-minded about it. I'm curious to see what more comes from it. I don't know a lot of the inner workings of it. Obviously, I don't work for the Big 12, but <laughs> I'm at minimum curious, I guess, is the best way to put it. Like, I'm, I'm interested. Yeah. Uh, intriguing is a good way to put it. Not like over the moon or anything, but it could work. Just going to have to wait and see. But, yeah. but going back to the wacky segment, if we could keep Keese and Prime forever, yeah, I would totally move all of our games to New York because Prime Keese, eventually we're going to be winning a few national championships. So, But yeah, that pretty much wraps up this episode of the Aggieville Alley Cats podcast. Thank you all so much for listening. If you want to follow or contact the show, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Aggieville Cats. That's capital A, capital A, and capital C and Cats. If you want to email us, we're AggievilleAlleyCats at gmail.com. If you want to follow us on a more personal note, I am at AC Edwards, zero, zero. I am at Connor Balthazor, capital C, capital B. And if you want to support the show financially, please be sure to check out the official Aggieville Alley Cats merch store, where you can find such designs as the staff-approved Doom Tang Clan, Play Sandstorm Cowards, and Neon Alley Cats. But most importantly, thank you all for listening to this episode of the Aggieville Alley Cats podcast, where come rain, shine, or anything in between, we're here to deliver to you the Kansas State sporting news that you so love. Stay safe, Alley Cats. <laughs>